Hello. Welcome to the website of the Knights of Freemasonry Universal. We're an organization of Masons from Masonic jurisdictions and bodies from across North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, India, and the Middle East. The mission of our organization is to promote what we call Universal Freemasonry. What do we mean by that? Simply, our organization exists to promote the highest principles and ideals of universal brotherhood so that Freemasonry always lives up to its greatest potential. What we stand for is nothing more but nothing less than that. In the videotaped interviews which follow, you will meet several Masons who speak about universal Freemasonry. Some of them are members of our organization and some of them are not. But all of them exemplify the highest ideals of the craft and the principles of universal Freemasonry. So, we now invite you to spend a little time with these brothers as they share some insights into the lofty principles and ideals of Freemasonry, the oldest and most noble fraternal organization in the world. Hello. We're sitting here this morning with Brother Rashid K. Sharif al -Bay. Brother Rashid has been a Freemason for more than 20 years. He is the co-chairman of the Knights of Freemasonry Universal. But in addition to that, he has also been the past master of Cornerstone Lodge Number 37, the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New York. He is a member of the Philalethe Society, the Phylaxis Society, the Scottish Rite Research Society, the Grand College of Rites, and the Dr. Charles H. Wesley Masonic Research Society as well. He is also a member of the Masonic Brotherhood of the Blue Forget-Me-Not, and he sits on the Work and Lectures Committee. Brother Rashid, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. I'd like to start off by just asking you to tell me a little bit about why you became a Mason. The most succinct answer would be personal example. A good friend of mine uh, in the neighborhood where I was living at the time, a businessman and a man whom I respected a great deal, uh, he and I got into a conversation one day about actually something totally unrelated to Freemasonry. And I made the wry observation that, well, you know, those Mason guys, they always help each other out and right. look out for each other. And he said, well, yes, that's true, um, but, but good friends do that. And uh, he said he knew some of the Masons, and they seemed to be pretty all right guys. And I was very much an anti-Masonic individual at the time. And I said, well, hey, you all can have it. And uh, he said, well, you know, if you ever change your mind, I can probably get you some paperwork. And about two weeks later, after I couldn't stop thinking about it, I asked him for some of that paperwork, and he got it for me. After I became a Mason, I found out that he actually was a member of the Lodge. That's a pretty cool story, Rashid. Um, tell me a little bit about what Freemasonry means to you. Freemasonry has meant different things to me over the course of the time I've been involved with it. Uh, and I would say that at this point, what it means to me is a, a methodology for personal transformation. It's a means uh, by which a man can assess himself, predict and project where he wants to be, what kind of man he wants to be, and gives him a set of tools, if you will, by which he can construct what he has perceived for his future. Now that's very interesting because you just used the words personal transformation. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Tell me about what you mean by personal transformation. Transformation from what and to what? Well, that's exactly the thing. Uh, it, it enables an individual to have a little bit more clarity on who they actually are. Um, I remember once a conversation that I had with my son, who was 12 at the time, and I asked him, uh, son, where are you? And he looked at me like I had three heads because he was sitting right in front of me. <laughs> and he knew I could see and hear him. Uh, but I put my hand on his knee and I said, am I touching you? And he said, well, of course you're touching me. And I said, well, am I touching you or am I touching your knee? He said, well, you're touching my knee. I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, what about now? He said, well, now you're touching my shoulder. I said, again, where are you? So Freemasonry uh, offers a context in which a person can ask themselves the kind of questions and make the kind of inquiries into who it is that they actually are right now. How do they come to be who they are right now? And then 
uh, having arrived at that information, where is it that I want to be and who is it that I want to be and how do I get from here to there? And that process involves the transformation of the individual. It's more than change. Uh, it's creating a new beingness, if I can use that word. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, you're the co-chairman of the Knights of Freemasonry Universal. Can you tell me how the Knights of Freemasonry Universal is different from any of the other many fraternal organizations you are a member of? Well, first of all, the Knights of Freemasonry Universal is uh, very interested in the whole humanity. Not that the rest of the organizations are not. But for one thing, Kofu does not require Mason, uh, Masonic membership as a key to admission into Kofu. But we accept all people who have an interest in the same kinds of directions that we do as far as the kind of community service, youth service, things of that nature. Uh, anybody who's got a willing hand, we have work for it. Awesome. Uh, the motto of the organization that was coined by the founder, Brother Dave Doherty, is the internal, not the external. And you've been talking a little bit about personal transformation. Tell us what that motto means to you. The internal is that is that person who's watching it's like the charioteer the external is the chariot we look at a man's face it's basically the numbers on the door that tell us the address and we know who we expect to be at home when we talk to him right we hear things from him that aren't usually the kinds of things we hear we know that you know, that's that's not ernie talking right now you know um when we hear ernie when we hear Roy, when we hear Rashid or Dave, and we know and recognize that voice, we, our ears have become attuned and attentive to what we can expect from the person based on where they are in life, who they've become. Then we're listening to who the man is. That's the internal. Uh, masonry looks at the intrinsic uh, equality of all human beings irrespective of stations in life, irrespective of rank. And there's a, a, a line in one of the funeral services, in fact, that talks about the staff of the beggar and the scepter of the king lying side by side at one point. And so this is what we're interested in, not what a man has, but who a man is. Okay. Now, from your perspective, what are the most important challenges facing the Masonic fraternity today? Well, one of them is to remain relevant. Masonry, like any system, has to operate inside the context of a task environment. As humanity develops, matures, uh, evolves, there is a change in the task environment. And so masonry needs to be able to adapt itself to what's going on around it so it can remain relevant and, and needful to the people. Uh, so in some countries, uh, the masonry that is practiced there is a little different because the needs of the society are a little different. Uh, individuals, masonry pra uh, 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 works in different ways in their lives because their personal needs are a little different. Uh, masonry is universal not only in the context of uh, a global activity, but it's also universal in terms of its personal application. All areas of life. I asked Brother Dave Doherty, the founder of our organization, uh, to explain a little bit about the, uh, the logo or the symbol of the Knights of Freemasonry Universal. And it is, of course, the square and compasses, which is well known uh, as a Masonic symbol. But there's a lot of other stuff on that logo as well. There's hands that are enjoined. There is a global symbol within a wreath. There are the symbols from the principal and major world religious traditions. What does that symbol mean to you? And tell us a little bit about the basic symbology as well of the square and compasses. Well, the square and compasses, uh, in, in, in a very, uh, I guess, basic presentation, of course, the square relates to nine degrees. It relates to, most people are familiar with the geometric figure right. of a square. Right. They don't 
we don't represent it that way, but it does hold some of the same meaning. Um, there are the four elements, and so you're, you're looking at material existence, and then there are the compasses which, uh, which uh, describe a circle, and for a lot of people that has spiritual connotations. So we look to unite the material needs of a man and the material aspirations of a man with the spiritual aspirations and create a balance between the two. Uh, that's one of the meanings of the square and compass. Uh, some of the other symbology uh, that's evident on our symbol has to do with, as you mentioned, the major religions. We see the major religions as more or less spokes on a wheel. We all recognize a hub in the center, and sometimes it can appear with the spokes in relation to the wheel and the hub that two people might be approaching from completely opposite directions and going in completely opposite directions, and yet somehow they're going in the same direction because they're going toward that same hub. Hmm. And that hub for us is uh, deity, divine consciousness, uh, the awakening uh, uh, of our own awareness of God within ourselves hmm. and our relationship to divine. There are other symbols on that uh, Kofu logo as well, uh, and the ones that speak to me are the mathematical symbols. Hmm. The thing I like about the mathematical symbols are it means what it means. It, 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 there's no ambiguity about mathematics. It's either right or it's not right. Uh, and you arrive at these kinds of conclusions no matter what religion you're practicing, no matter what spiritual perspective you're looking at things from. There's an underlying current, an underlying thread that unites all of us irrespective of the particulars of our practice. And Masonry sees itself as the center of union and allows us to develop connections with one another where otherwise we might have remained at perpetual distance. Right. Brother Rashid, something that you and I have spoken of many times in the past uh, seems to me an appropriate topic for our conversation this morning. And we've touched upon it a little bit here today, and that is the uh, the union of all the different faith traditions under the umbrella of Freemasonry. You're a practicing Muslim. Indeed. I'm a practicing Buddhist. We have brothers that were here this weekend who were Jewish. We know of brothers who are practicing Hindus and so forth. Um, what does that tell you and what does that mean to you from the perspective not only of religious tolerance but also in light of all of the religious conflicts that are still happening in the world today? Well, and I hope I don't sound uh, too cynical when I say this, uh, it tells me for one thing that a lot of people really don't understand the religions that they have. Uh, it tells me that where there is a will to get along and a will to understand, it can be done. We've been demonstrating it for hundreds of years already. Uh, Tolerance, there are very powerful examples of tolerance across religions and across centuries, but it has not been the general uh, way of approaching things. Most people approach things from a standpoint of being right. Yeah. And if you're right, it means you're in the same tent as me. Well, it's possible for all of us to be in many different tents, but yet the same camp. And so... You know, masonry takes that view. Now you've used an interesting word here, and I want to follow up on it, and that's the word tolerance. And I think the word tolerance is a, is a great concept, but I know of some people who say that, well, tolerance just means that you're really just going to put up with somebody else. Um, in my experience, Freemasonry seems to actually sort of promote an appreciation for other perspectives. Would you care to speak to that a little bit in terms of what tolerance means or what maybe an actual appreciation of someone else's perspective might mean. Well, there's, a, there's a, a, a place that people have to start. People have to be able to get in the door somehow. Right. And tolerance is the way to get in the door. Uh, it, tolerance for me means that it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm settling in from a late shift at work. I'm just getting to sleep. But the neighbor, two doors down, is just beginning the day and has let the dog out. The dog's barking in the yard. I can't tell this neighbor not to let the dog out in the yard. I've got to somehow learn to live with it. 
I can lie there in the bed and keep myself awake hating the dog and the neighbor for having him. <laughs> or, or at some point I can, I can learn to kind of just accept the fact the dog's out there, he's not going anywhere. As long as I live there, he's going to live there. And we've got to get along somehow. And so I, I, I begin to change myself with respect to what I initially may have perceived as a problem. Uh, people who live next door to airports go through it all the time, and after a while they don't hear the planes anymore. Yeah. Uh, their tolerance level has been increased. Uh, in time, tolerance moves from tolerance to acceptance. We begin to look at one another and accept the differences. After accepting the differences, we begin to learn from the differences, and we begin to grow ourselves as a result of the differences that uh, contrast our own ways of being. And so now our differences serve one another and we both come away better. From acceptance, we move into appreciation. So tolerance is a doorway. It's a place to start. Well, that's an excellent analogy. Let's take that next step. Uh, you and I come from different faith traditions, and yet I know from our conversations that we understand each other very well. And we find, I know you and I have both experienced this, that it seems that the people who have a bit of a, of a mystical perspective on their faith traditions seem to understand each other very well and have moved from simple tolerance to an appreciation of other perspectives and an understanding where a Buddhist and a Muslim are speaking almost the same language, so to speak, or any other two faith traditions that you care to think of that are in our organization. What would you have to say about that next step? I used to be an electronics technician when I was in the Navy. And we had technical manuals for every piece of equipment that was within the purview of our particular trade. Um, radios, radar, you name it. And some of these technical manuals were three, four, five inches thick. And you had to really not only master the equipment, but you had to master how to read the manual so that you would know how to serve the equipment and get the best use out of it. The human being, irrespective of the faith tradition, the age, the gender, the, uh, the culture, the human being essentially has the same nature no matter what context you put him or her in. And there is a, a technical manual for understanding the operation of the human being. And we sometimes operate incorrectly, and we have to know how to read the technical manual to get the proper operation out of ourselves. Um, I, I, I imagine that that technical manual is probably a lot like a book that, that uh, botanists or somebody would read about how to understand plants. Uh, you take a seed, you plant it in the ground, uh, You've got to know what kind of soil is best suited to that particular kind of seed, how much water is enough, how much water is too much, how much light, how much sun provides the right amount of warmth, the right climate for that kind of uh, seed. After a time, you see a root begin to come down out of the bottom, and you see a shoot after a time begin to come out from the top. In order for that to happen, the shell has got to break. The shell is necessary to protect the life of the original seed, but there comes a time that the shell outlives its usefulness, and if we don't break the shell, then the shell destroys the life that it was actually intended to serve and to protect. Religion is a lot like that shell. We have to have it in order to give some structure to our spiritual development, to give us some guidelines. You know, it's like a child learning to color inside the lines. But after a while, as the artistic uh, 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 skill develops, the child doesn't need lines anymore. After a while, that shoot uh, or that seed doesn't need the shell. And if the shell remains so rigid that it precludes the ability of the shoot to come upward and the, the root to go downward, that seed will die. And that's the reason for a lot of what we see going on in the world today in the name of religion. It's the, the killing of the spiritual instinct or the spiritual impulse by being stultified, calcified, petrified by an overzealous attachment to a book of rules 
as against understanding what the rules are intended to serve and foster and promote and develop and nurture and fall away. A lot of people look at the spiritually developed person and say he's broken his religion when in fact he's fulfilled the purpose of his religion and internalized that purpose and stands as the divine intended us to stand. Brother Rashid, that was a fantastic answer. Thank you very much. That very wise answer. Do you feel that Freemasonry in general and the Knights of Freemasonry Universal in particular help men to move past that shell? I absolutely do. Uh, it is not a guarantee that every man who is admitted to Freemasonry moves past that shell. But that is rather analogous to the oak tree that may drop a thousand acorns and two or three of them uh, also become trees. Um, but they don't lose anything from their religion, from their religious uh, uh, perspective, right. from their religious growth and development. But they stand to gain a great deal. I have spoken to many men in my few years in Masonry and I have experienced myself um, actually getting a deepening uh, awareness, a deepening perception, and a deepening appreciation of the faith path that we're on, whatever that faith path may be, our own you know, religious opinions being left to ourselves, how we want to apply the tools that Masonry gives us is up to us. Uh, but I've, I've, I've spoken with a lot of uh, brothers who have experienced a deepening, more enriching religious life. Some go on to become religious leaders as a result of uh, combining their religious perceptions and perspectives with what they get from Freemasonry. Now that's a very interesting point because we've been talking about how Freemasonry facilitates that development and yet uh, sadly we, you and I both know of, uh, of instances and sometimes many instances where men will become Masons and for some reason seem not to get it, seem not to ever break that shell. How do you explain that? Water seeks its own level. Water seeks its own level. Indeed so. Tell us more. Have you ever had the experience of reading a book and enjoying the book, putting the book on the shelf, going about your work, maybe a month passes, maybe a year, maybe a decade, and you go back and you read that book again and it's as if you're reading a completely different book? It's because we read through the filter and through the prism of our own experience. Uh, our own experience necessarily biases us in favor of some things, in disfavor of some others. One of the uh, beauties uh, of life and its experiences is that it, it lends wisdom to us. Experience is sometimes the best teacher for those who are willing to learn from the experience. Uh, there, is, there is something uh, in the Greek having to do with wisdom. Most people are pretty familiar with the Greek concept of wisdom as Sophia. Mm -hmm. uh, not as many are familiar with uh, wisdom as phronesis. And phronesis is usually pictured with a hand mirror to teach us reflection and a healing staff of Aesculapius with a serpent wrapping around heading toward the top of it. And this is a healing symbol. We look at reflection into our own lives and it heals us by giving us some balance. What we learn from our experiences and reflecting on those experiences gives us prudence for making decisions that serve us best now, but also that give us some foresight on what we can expect based on the context we see now. And everybody is not able to look from the same place because everybody doesn't stand in the same place. Everybody's experiences don't bring them to the same place. This is how we choose different paths for religion. This is how we choose different paths for education, for assessing what our, uh, uh, our, our best traits and skills and talents might be. And, you know, uh, uh, a canary is a wonderful bird, sings a wonderful song, but it doesn't make a good alarm clock. <laughs> now, a rooster, that's another story. So we have to know where we are and what, how we best serve. Um, and recognize and allow room for the fact that how we best serve can change over time as we ourselves change. So that's why you think some men 
will come into the fraternity, be exposed to the teachings of the fraternity, and grow with that experience while others will not? Indeed. And those who do grow won't grow in the same ways. Some men will grow um, in terms of their experience of, of, of loving kindness toward other, other human beings uh, through charitable outreach. Other men, it will be that they'll, they'll learn a better sense of fellowship than they came in with. Other men may become deeply introspective and move out on a very spiritual, mystic kind of path. Uh, some people, their growth will be more inward, others, their growth will be more outward. It all depends on where the person is when they come in. And I've been learning something, uh, Brother Ernie, that you probably already know, and that is that who comes to the banquet with the most eats the best. It's a very good analogy. Thank you so much. Indeed. All right. Well, Brother Rashid, we've had a wonderful conversation this morning, and you've had some very wise things to say, and I'm hoping that when we put this on the website, some people will be able to see not only our conversation this morning, but the other discussions that have happened over this weekend. So I just want to finish up by asking you this final question. If a non-Mason were to ask you, what is the most rewarding part of Freemasonry, what would you say? Personal growth, fellowships, trust. Is there anything further you want to add? Only that I can't thank God enough for the day that he inspired me to change my mind about this fraternity. Brother Rashid, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure talking to you, as it always is. Thank you. Pleasure's been all mine.